Xiao is a big fan of Hot Pot as well. And um, he created a model that he's going to talk about today, actually. Um, super impressive. Um, and in my opinion, it has the ability to basically revolutionize how we look at long-term phenology. Um, and I think you'll all agree with me by the time we finish this presentation. Uh, so with that, Dr. Gao, take it away. Thanks. Thanks, Ian. Um, hi, everyone. It's very honored to be here. It's such a nice and beautiful place, Cairo Institute. Um, I'm very glad to visit. Um, today, I'm going to talk about my research. Um, part of that is in my uh, dissertation, PhD dissertation, and part of that uh, is uh, what I'm doing currently doing at Howard Forest. Um, so I study phenology, but different from like traditional way. I study phenology using remote sensing. Um, so those satellite images. Um, oops. So I think all of you are already familiar with phenology. So what I will be just briefly talk about this. So the uh, phenology is about seasonality, and normally you will have um, a bunch of people going out, or experts, or like students um, going out to the field regularly and check those trees. Uh, their status. I took this picture at Howard Forest uh, uh, last year. So uh, the other ways, like you can use phenocams or those cameras mounted in, at the site and constantly watch the canopy, right? Um, but those two ways are relatively small in special regions because you, I mean, you can't move kind of cameras everywhere. Uh, so we do this for um, you using satellite images, um, like those satellites constantly revisit the. Earth, and we can do large-scale dynamics using this um, satellite images time series. So how do we do it? Um, there are several sensors that are um, widely used, not mostly widely used, but widely used in the, uh, in the field. The first one is this MODIS. So it's 500 meter, um, in case you don't do remote sensing. So 500 meter special resolution means a grid 500 meter by 500 meter. That's one pixel. It's pretty coarse, right? And the second one is uh, Sentinel-2, is 10 meter, so this is final resolution. And the third one is Landsat. I'll talk about Landsat uh, later. Um, so this animation shows you the uh, dynamics of leaf greenness we observe using satellite images. And this is from MODIS. So you can see the, uh, the animation, the, the leaf greenness changes like over the year. And how we retrieve phenology information is showing in this diagram. So we calculate these vegetation indices, um, more popular would be this NDVI. So this here we are using EVI too, it's the same, same thing. Um, and we, I mean, once we observe the whole year, we will have a curve like this. And we retrieve those, mark, we mark those critical points like here. Um, for example, 15% of the amplitude, we would say that's green up, and 50% that's mid green up and maturity and, and so on. So this is how we retrieve phenology from satellite images. Um, I'd like to show this image from Ian uh, and my favorite supervisor, Dr. Josh Grieg. Um, this image has a lot of information, so I'm not going to dive into details. But if you're interested, you can ask Ian. Uh, I think he's, he's willing to talk about this. But the point I'm showing this map here is that MODIS is very good at capturing this large scale um, dynamics of phenology. We have a bunch of phenometrics here, and it's very nice to see like the um, out of the globe how vegetations are um, responding to the environment and there's how their seasonality changes. So that's um, that's the introduction for my um, work, and now I'm going to talk about the first um, paper I published. Uh, so using this MODIS phenology thing, so. Because MODIS is very good at capturing large scale uh, dynamics, so we were wondering, you know, phenology is the first order control of carbon sequestration because they have like green season length. They control that green season length. Um, and, you know, the maximum of green, the ma maximum of carbon you can observe or the potential rate by, was determined by this greening or the maximum leaf biomass, right? If you have more bi leaf biomass, you will have a larger potential of capturing more carbon. So we want to understand. Um, how these two, these green season length and leaf greening, they jointly affect the like annual productivity, or we use GPP here, gross primary productivity, to uh, use that as a measure uh, of productivity. So normally, this GPP can be directly measured by these flux towers installed at like locations, at different locations. But again, those flux towers are also like regional. 
they cannot do large scales because we cannot install those towers everywhere, right? So we want to use, we want to say, well, can we use remote sensing, satellite-based, these um, phenology observed green signal length and leaf greening to infer this, um, uh, this uh, GPP, annual GPP, annual carbon sequestration productivity, and that way we can upscale the whole thing to the um, whole Earth, right, large scale. So how, we do, how did we do that? We, we use all of these, um, those are flex tower sites. We have 100, 166 sites, and that's over 1,000 site years of data globally, and we categorize them as, uh, as evergreen and deciduous based on their um, planet functional type. Um, this is measured data, right? And then we have those GPP time series. And what we did was we applied for this um, MODIS phenology algorithm to this GPP time series, and then we retrieve those phenology. Those, so those are photosynthetic phenology, right? So the, they, they represent their, when do they start accumulating uh, carbon and when they senescence, but in a photosynthesis way. So these are the curves. Uh, once we observe that, we want to model, I mean, it's a pretty simple model, linear regression. So the y-axis is annual GPP, and you have a uh, green signal length, maximum, minimum, as the uh, predictors. I would say this model is, is very intuitive. And it, think about that, you're doing a curve, you're measuring the error under this curve using maximum and the green signal length or the width of this um, curve. So, of course, this model will work. Um, but that's geometry, right? Um, we want to know, can we substitute these variables using um, satellite-based uh, predictors? Um, and to, to observe or to investigate the biome level effects and, and site level effects, we, we adapted this model to a uh, basic hierarchical um, structure so we can have like intercepts and slopes vary by biome and vary by site so we can quantify their uh, effects. The result is here. So look at the first column. This is the flux-based uh, model. It's the first model here. You can tell R square is pretty good, right? This is the biome level effect. This is once you add site level effect, pretty good, right? But this model is used is because you have to know what's the maximum GPP, you know, what's the minimum GPP, and to model this. I mean, if you already know this information, you don't, you don't need this model, right? Um, so the second column is our satellite-based um, performance. You can tell, I mean, adding biome level effect, you have over 50% of the uh, variance can be explained. So that's pretty, I mean, reasonable, I would say. Uh, and biome level, biome types are not that hard to, to, to find. The critical point is here is the site level effect. So if you add site level effect, the accuracy will increase a lot. But the site level effect is like you have to observe the um, background, background GPP uh, information for that site. That's also, I mean, you cannot do that everywhere. But we, are, we, we thought uh, this site level effect may be explained by environmental factors. For example, temperature, your light condition, water availability, those things. So uh, there, there is a um, PhD student at Boston University following this work. So he, he used a machine learning model to like, incorporate all of this uh, temperature, like, like environmental factors into his machine learning model and predicted this site level effect. And I think this manuscript is still under review right now. But what I'm saying is it's promising using those satellite images to uh, infer or upscale those GBP measurements. Uh, that's the first thing. The, ooh, okay. The, first, the second thing we did was, okay, since we know like we want to understand what's the relative effect of GPP, uh, sorry, GSL, green signal length, and the maximum and minimum of those predictors, right? Contribution to the um, annual GPP. So we normalized the model, and here shows the result. So these big dots, they are averaged uh, effects, and those small dots are like biome level effect, um, biome level variation. So the most important thing for this figure is that you will notice that maximum, these maximum predictors are uh, their magnitude are higher than um, green signal length and the minimum. So this is suggesting that the maximum leaf biomass you can have would have a larger effect than green signal length changes uh, to annual GBP or annual carbon sequestration. So we, based on this, we uh, concluded that 
maximum is more important than green resilience to carbon uptake. So currently, global greening trends might be more important than phenological changes to, uh, in terms of carbon sequestration. Um, we published this paper in Global uh, Biogeochemical Cycles, and the main takeaways are, like uh, the first one, satellite-based phenology can be informative in um, upscaling this thing. And second is, um, we think future green nutrients are more important than phenological changes um, on carbon, on, on carbon uh, uh, budgets. So that's the first, like that's the MODIS-based large-scale phenology. MODIS is good, but if you want to zoom in, you know, 500 meter for a pixel is kind of uh, coarse. So in 2019, my previous advisor, Dr. Josh Green, and a, a professor at Boston University, uh, Dr. Mark Friedel, they made this uh, 30 meter phenology product um, for the whole North America. It uses, it combines Sentinel-2 and Landsat together to make this um, product. So it's short term after 2016 because Sentinel-2 was launched in 2015. Um, it's pretty good, and if you compare these maps, you will see if you, the benefit of going higher uh, special resolution, right? It generates more details. More interestingly, we, so we were like, oh, okay, we, uh, we got this new product, and this product has finer special resolution. What about we do this with, uh, you know, field plots? Because people are doing those field experiments. Maybe this can give us an opportunity to combine satellite-based data with the field observer data. So we did this. Um, the first, you will see, this is our plot. I mean, a forestry department, they set up those plots in a region. And if you plug this onto a MODIS map, which is 500 meters, you will get, you know, two pixels <laughs> for the whole plot. There's no way to distinguish, like, what's the controlled plot, what's the experimental plot. But if we do this by uh, this 30 meter product. I mean, it's not perfect, but you will, you you can sort of distinguish where are the controlled plot, and where are the experimental plot. So we we wanted to understand for this. We wanted to uh, understand whether cellular remote sensing can be useful to like link um, can be useful in, in investigating those field uh, measurements and how this phenology can be inform how this phenology can be used to model like tree stem growth. Uh, observed on the ground. So our forestry department was testing fertilization effect, soil culture, and thinning effect on the, in, in these fields. And now we have cellular remote, remote license phenology. So we, what we do was like build a simple model, right? Simple linear regression model. And let me walk you through this figure. This is the coefficients of the um, model. So the y-axis is the plot level. Um, biomass or stem growth, I would say, the volume um, of trees. And you can tell those predictors, I mean, silviculture, it's obvious, right? You have, you have fertilized, you fertilize those trees and they, they grow up bigger. Um, density is also effective significantly. But here I, I, I should mention that this is plot level, not individual trees. Uh, this is saying if you have higher density, you have more trees, the overall they, they have more volume growth. But that does not mean every tree has like grown bigger. Um, but more interestingly, because we're looking at phenology, so here the green up shows up, this uh, coefficient shows up saying, saying that if you have earlier green up, it's associated with higher volume growth. And this maturity says if you have later maturity, you will have higher volume growth. So combining them together, let's look at this curve. So green up is here, uh, maturity is here, so we call this green up season. So we say, well, if you have a longer green up season, this is associated with the higher volume growth. Um, and we published this paper in the Agriculture and Forest Meteorology. And the main takeaway is pretty simple. It's just this longer green up period is associated with greater uh, volume growth. Now, this 30 meter product, awesome, but it's, it's short term because, like I said, Senator 2 was launched in 2015. You cannot go back, back in time to say, well, I, I, I want to observe phenology like 20 years ago. No way. Um, then I came up with this idea, like, can we do it by Landsat? Because Landsat, if you, if you combine Landsat 5, 7, and 8, you will have, I mean, now we have Landsat 9, so you will have almost 40 years of observations. And Landsat is all the 30 meters, right? But why? there isn't any Landsat-based phenology data set. 
it turns out the biggest challenge is data sparsity. So this is an example time series. So x axis is date, y axis is, again, this EVI2 means like represent the leaf greenness. So if you observe this curve, and I mean some years like this, you will have, you will have more data points. You will say, well, this is obvious, this is seasonality. You can fit a curve and retrieve those data out. But in other years, you're, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, six points. How can you tell? like phenology from those six points, how can you fit a curve, right? There's no way, so um, I did a, oops, so I did a simple survey at one of the study regions at Nashville. So this figure shows, this bar plot, x axis number of clear observations, which, is, which means the observation we can use in a year, and y axis is year. So you can tell, I mean, the, here, in the 90s, especially in the 80s and 90s, we have maybe like 10, on average, 10 points for year on average. And then you go to 999, it adds up a little bit because we have Landsat 7. And then 2012, Landsat 5 retired. Again, you're back to, you're back to like 10. And then 2015, uh, we have Sentinel 2 and Landsat 8. You know, that's really, the, so the biggest challenge is actually in the 90s, and, uh, in the 80s and 90s. Um, so, once we investigated this problem a little bit, like we, we pondered for, for the, this a little bit, um, and fortunately, we we thought we we, we found a way to solve this problem. Um, this is the model um, I developed, but I'm not going to talk too, too, many, too much about this um, equations. But in general, it's a pretty simple idea. So, phenology is a seasonality, right? Seasonality does not change dramatically. Let's say last year. I observe spring phenology, or like the time of their leaf out was, let's say, May 1st. I don't have any data this year, but I would guess somewhere this year it will happen like May 1st, somewhere around May 1st, not in January, not in August, right? So the, um, the idea was maybe we can borrow information from other years and using, use those information as a prior, and now we have I mean, this suits the Bayesian analysis very well. So you have a prior, and this year you only have several data points, but you can use those several data points to update your prior and get a posterior distribution, and it will give you a uh, uncertainty. So this is a general idea, pretty simple, right? Uh, I developed this model, and um, here's the result. So this time series is from uh, a, a example plot at Harvard Forest. Again, x axis is uh, date, y-axis is the leaf greenness, EVI2. You can tell, I mean, the, the red line is the fitted curve. It fits very well. And the uh, polygons, those are, those are uh, uncertainties. So you have the uncertainty estimation. The thing I want to show you, like, uh, particularly, is this 1984. So we don't have any observations in the spring of 1984 because Landsat 5 was launched in that year, in, in, the, in that spring. So you don't have any observations. But the model also gives you a guess, you know, albeit with the, although the uncertainty or the 95% uh, credible interval will be larger. Uh, but my point is like the model has a guess, right? And it ha has an uncertainty. And you can use this uncertainty to estimate how confident you are to use that point. So it's, it's very flexible. Um, and those are other years, I mean, you, if you have more data, you will have um, a better fit and the uncertainty will be uh, shorter. This year is also interesting because, you know, there's, there's just a point. I mean, in spring, there are two points, but this point is right set on the uh, start of a season location. So the uncertainty is relatively short. Um, so we think we've, we solved the problem. We have the long-term observations. Let me 40 years of uh, phenology using Landsat annual it's annual and it's 30 meters, and we have this uncertainty to tell you the, um, how confident you can use those estimates. Um, and of course, we're not doing math uh, game, right? We want to compare with ground observations. So we did that with the Hubbard Forest uh, Ground Observer Phenology and Hubbard Book Experimental Forest. I mean, spring is generally con uh, very consistent. Um, and autumn, I mean, autumn is a, a bit off, but it's not totally like, it's, it's reasonable, I would say. It's, I mean, if you look at this mean absolute deviance, it's three days and uh, five days. It's not that uh, different. 
uh, and also, I mean, observing autumn phenology, I think, is still a challenging for remote sensing because, I mean, trees turn, they, they, their leaves turn, uh, turn brown and there are also leaves fall. I mean, it's, it's hard to uh, distinguish the signals from satellite images. But overall, we think, I mean, this um, Bayesian Lancer phenology, we call it BOSP, is generally consistent with uh, ground observations. And of course, we have that 30 meter product, right? So we want to compare that product in 2016 and 2019. And this is the map of BOSP, and this is a comparison you can see. It's pretty consistent with the uh, product. But again, this product is short term, it's only four years, um, but BOSP can do um, 40 years. Uh, and the last map I want to show is the comparison between MODIS and BOSP. At, uh, this is uh, Nashville. This is in Nashville 20, 2018. This map is interesting because first you will see, I mean, the benefit of going higher resolution. And if I don't tell you this is a city, I, I guess no one can tell this is a city, right? Um, the other thing is you will see more yellow colors in this map compared to this map. We think that's scaling effect. So coarse resolution might have a bias uh, in, in spring phenology, so it might bias the earlier uh, um, than the actual phenology is. We have seen this for um, at, at many places. So what we are doing at this moment is um, constantly or um, comprehensively investigate this uh, this this uh, scaling effects. But that's that's what I'm working on now. So we published this model in a remote sensing environment, and uh, we made this R package because. Once I published this model, uh, sometimes I, I got emails uh, from people asking, are you going to make this a product? Um, but unfortunately, I couldn't because the model, you know, Bayesian methods is nice, but it's very slow. It's very computationally intensive. So to make this map, it took our high-performance computing cluster with 600 cores to run for two weeks. So it's impossible to like, you know, scale up for the whole globe and make a product. So we provide this package so people can you know, compute their own data. And I would say, I, I would thank Ian here because Ian documented all of this um, product, uh, th this package and wrote a tutorial for how to use this package. So um, those are observations, right? We, we, we've seen, uh, phenology from MODIS, 500 meter, then 30 meter MS LSP, then 30 meter long term BOSP. But those are observations. We're not satisfying just to say, well, we observe phenology, but we also want to understand phenology, right? And um, I was very interested in this chilling effect uh, on spring phenology. So if you uh, are familiar with this, uh, it's, it's like trees, has to be, trees have to be uh, exposed in uh, sufficiently low temperature in winter before they can receive uh, spring signal and, and um, or accumulating green degree days in the spring and to, uh, to develop leaves. So this is, this is suggesting that temperature has dual effects, right? In winter, you, need, you want lower temperature. In, in spring, you want a higher temperature, so you have a, a earlier spring green up. So I, I'm, I was very interested in this showing effect. I wanted to, un, I wanted to like, understand this effect on spring phenology. So how did previous studies uh, do this? The first method was um, control lag experiments, where you know you have those uh, greenhouse chambers. You put trees or siblings or cuttings into these greenhouse chambers, and then you treat them with different temperature in spring and, and in winter. Um, the other way is through modeling. You know, ideally, you have a bunch of observations, phenology observations, and you have temperature data. If you fit a model with the with the um, thermal time or without chilling, and a model with chilling, and the model with chilling outperform the other one, then you will conclude that chilling is important. The process is important, right? And the third way is, is through this relationship. Some of you might be familiar with this relationship. It says like, if, you are, if you experience more, uh, or if you accumulate more cold temperatures, the heating requirement for spring would, would be reduced. So you'll have um, less forcing in the spring to leaf out. This is, this is also pretty famous. So I mean, I don't have, I don't have experience in lab experiments, so I started here. I want to know, like, can I um, fit models and, and figure this out? So there are several models. The first one is thermal time model. It's or more famous name is green degree day model. So you accumulate 
green degree days and once there's a, so I, I think I have a figure. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So it has three parameters, a T naught where you start accumulating your green degree day. A base temperature is like above this temperature you will, you will consider that's a green degree day and you, you, you calculate the difference between uh, temperature and this T base to get accumulating of uh, how many green degree units you have. And this is the accumulated curve, green degree day, thermal forcing effect. And once it reaches some threshold, you will say, well, spring phenology happens here. So this is a simple model. There's no chilling, right? This is just a uh, thermal time model. And I, I should mention this model has 300 years of history. And then, oh, I have this little, okay. And then the, these models consider children in different ways. I'm not going to show these equations, but in general, they are, they are uh, hypothesis in different processes for children and how that children process affect the, um, the, the spring accumulating this process. So ideally, if I fit all of these models to my data, and any of these model, any of these children model outperformed my thermal time model, I would say children is important. Uh, just a comparison, I also add a linear regression to say, well, if, if the only predictor is uh, mean temperature of spring, can we use uh, how, how good this model can compare with other models? So I obtained a bunch of uh, different data sources. So here, MCD12Q2 is the mode is based uh, cellular remote sensing phenology, and the day mat is the, like a graded temperature product. At these locations, those flux tower locations, because uh, they are forested sites and they have ground measure temperature, so I can then compare whether that's um, graded temperature products or the uh, you know whether the graded temperature capture the, uh, the the dynamics, just to compare these two groups, and then I also observed Harbor Forest and Harbor Brook data, and I mean ground temperature measure in these locations, and this citizen scientist based. Data set. This is, this is, I think, possibly uh, the most widely used citizen scientist database in the field. Um, see, they are in Europe. They have a lot of sites there, um, and I'm using that with a graded temperature product. So I have a bunch of models. Oh, sorry, I have only a bunch of data, and I have a bunch of models. I fit them, um, but it was kind of surprising because. So if you do goodness of fit, if you just fit those models, you will find some models, some more complex models outperform simpler ones because they have more parameters, right? But if you do cross validation, you will find them generally similar. And surprisingly, this linear regression model with just one predictor, which is the pre-mean temperature, does as well as other models most of the time. And this simple thermal type model also does very well in general. I should say this, um, result is consistent with the, with the previous analysis, but I added all of these um, data sources. So this is surprising because it says, I mean, thermal time model is, is doing good. And possibly that's the reason why, like, after 300 years, we're still using that model, right? But does that say children is not important? Well, I dig into that model structure. What I found was, I mean, I'm not going to, I'm not going to show equations, but in general, I think the problem was in, um, first, is the model structure. So I found these parameters in the model are highly correlated. So you, you can tell the base temperature and F grade, their correlation is about, about one. So which means you can use this model, you can fit this model and do prediction. But if you wanna go back and say, well, because this model works very well for this site, and let me retrieve those base temperature and F grade, these variables, and say, well, that's the variable for this site. And if you do other sites, you know, you can sort of get those variation. But that variation might not be true because they are highly correlated. You know, um, so they might just be you know, numerical issues rather than, rather than um, ecological issue or physiological. The other, the other thing I found was, um, it's possible that, I mean, we're doing modeling it's possible that for natural temperature, they, their variation lags. So every year, your temperature is kind of similar. Even though children is important, you might not find it uh, using those models. So I stuck it there. Then I started looking at this negative chilling forcing relationship. I mean, this is pretty simple. If you calculate chilling, you calculate forcing. Um, and you, if you find this relationship, then that says chilling is important. That's 
at least that's what they do in those uh, papers published in the mainstream journals, right? Um, but if you think about that, let's say it's a fixed t time period. If it's not a chilling day, it's a forcing day. You know what I'm saying? It's negatively correlated by nature. I mean, your calculation won't be that perfectly correlated, but it's negatively correlated. So what I did was I grabbed their data and I fitted a simulation. So we have a bunch of uh, spring phenology observations. Now I fit this therm simple thermal time model. Again, this model does not consider chilling, right? I fit this model and I grabbed those uh, model fitted simulated spring phenology, which means this simulated data set does not have any chilling effect. So it's chilling free. Now, if I apply this methodology to the simulated data set, what do I find? So I found over 60% of the time you will get this relationship. What this means is no matter chilling is important or not, you will always get this relationship. You know, it's, it's not chilling, it's just how you calculate um, this effect. The other thing is, um, the other typical example is this paper published last year in Global Change Biology. Um, so what they did was, so they said, well, negative chilling force relationship is interest, interesting. Now let's calibrate this uh, relationship using a model and we can test the chilling and forcing contributions to spring phenology in the past and maybe in the future if you have uh, future projections of temperature. This is a key figure. This one is spring phenology. You can see it's spring phenology advancing. And these bars shows the comp contribution of chilling and forcing. Uh, you can see this blue line is chilling. So chilling contribution is increasing, right? Um, like I said, I suspect that there might be correlations in our methodology. So what I did was I grabbed the data again, I fit to my simulation, and I found this curve. This is, so I made this uh, thing. Th this figure is, the sim is very similar to their figure, right? So the point here is that even though chilling is not important, by using this methodology, you will get this thing out. So, but I'm not blaming anyone, so anyone's doing, right, doing, doing it wrong. Uh, I, I, I don't have the answer either. Um, but my point is that we should be cautious of drawing inferences from those models and those methodology. Um, we wrote this comment uh, paper, uh, but I mean, it's very hard to get this published. Uh, it's been rejected twice. The most important thing here, or most funny thing here, is that after each rejection, I got more and more confident about my methodology. So I think there's there got to be something, and I want to make my point. And, and now it's, it's under review again, so let's see uh, this time. So we've, we've talked about phenology observations, and I've talked about those models. They might not work as uh, we expected. So I dived into statistics again. I found this uh, time to even survive analysis. So this is the model they use to study you know, cancers and uh, those disease, diseases, and they wanted to they can predict when a patient, or the probability of a patient having uh, cancer or some disease. So I, I used this model, and I fit those, I mean, chilling and forcing, and a bunch of like technical work, I would say. And then um, the other point is, like I mentioned, maybe you don't have that variation in natural errors. I mean, temperature are generally similar. So I think controlled experiments is the, is the key point here to help us understand like when should we accumulate chilling or forcing, and what kind of temperature are effective to chilling or forcing, right? Um, but I don't do control experiments, so what I do is like maybe urban heat island effect can be used because urban heat island would you know heat up the uh, winter temperature, so it might create some variation. So what I did was um, I selected those. Um, these are tree canopy covers, and these are the. Uh, impervious surface area, I used to select cities. And of course my, so I, these, I selected those cities, of course my, my own uh, BOSP data set because that's the only data set you can u use to retrieve 40 years of phenology. Um, and I did comparison, I mean this is, compar is uh, comparable to the 500 meter modus and the 30 meter MS IOSP. And this is the urban heat island effect. You can tell this is the temperature. I mean this is the, I think it's UV medicine. Uh, you can tell that this center urban core is constantly warmer than uh, rural areas. Um, 
I'm not going to, because this is ongoing work, uh, I'm not going to talk too much details, but overall, I think in general what we found is we quantified those churning effects for the first time uh, using urban heat island effect, and uh, the result is generally consistent with this paper, which is based on uh, lab, controlled lab experiments, so that gave us some uh, confidence in this. Uh, I'm still working on that, so uh, maybe later. So, okay, now this, I've talked about those, uh, my, those are my previous dissertation work um, about phenology. And I want to use the uh, last two slides to describe what I'm doing at Harvard Forest and to see like, if, if you, uh, there are any opportunities we can collaborate, that would be awesome. So um, the first thing I did at Harvard Forest uh, was this. So we wanted to make a species map. Like you are doing remote sensing, you are looking at very like coarse resolution. Even though it's 30 meter by 30 meter, there are a lot of uh, species, right? And you don't know which species are which species, and you're merging them together to do phenology and other things. So we want to say, can we make a uh, species map so you can combine this map with the uh, with, uh, um, other observations like phenology and other uh, physiological observations. Uh, but this thing, I mean, if you, if you think about machine learning, you can observe a bunch of predictors and predict the species one by one, right? But it might give you some um, species composition for that pixel or for that site that does not exist in nature. You know what I'm saying? So it's like you're predicting really maple oaks together, and you know, some, at some places they don't grow together or they don't grow up um, simultaneously, I would say. So what, what we are doing is we want to do this species community controlled uh, prediction. Um, I'm not pretending. I'm not going to pretend I understand Google AI, but uh, this is what we are using. So we are collaborating with Google. We, we have a bunch of these satellite images and, and this climate data, and I think this is elevation and, and those um, geography uh, data. We have a bunch of uh, predictors feeding the Google AI, and the product come out, coming out is this species map. We, we did that for the whole New England. Um, you can see those variation. In general, I mean, the because we con control for the species composition. So if you look at the individual species, the, the R squared value won't be very high. We are comparing with the previous um, product. We have some increasing, but not, not that high. It's still ongoing work. Um, but the, the beauty of this method is that you, you can have species composition constraints. So you don't, you don't make um, unrealistic predictions. Um, yeah, I, I, we think this product in, can uh, have some uh, very nice uses, like you can, like I said, you can do phenology, spe species specific phenology, and, and if you're running landscape simulation models, you need to know those species as well, right? The other thing um, I did at Howard Forest was, um, so, was this ecosystem modeling. So I wanted to have a model that um, can run, can, can, can be helpful in hypothesis testing. So for example, if I, uh, if I say, well, churning is important, I wanted to improve the model, uh, the, the spring phenology model, using my own scientific findings. Um, how would that compare to other models? And how would this new model help us better predict carbon or other things? So that's the ecosystem modeling part. But when I was first diving into this, um, this field, I realized the, it's, it's, it was more difficult than I thought because there are, there are a lot of like legacy code. You know, they are written in Fortran, C++, C Sharp, Visual Basic. That's the oldest I, I've ever seen. And then they don't have consistent, consistent um, documentation. Their algorithms are in. You say, well, they give you a list of publications from 1980s to 2000. Say, well, those are the algorithms. And you can see this uh, evolution of this model. But there's no consistent documentation. So the first step I did was um, I wanted to make, because I want to do hypothesis testing, right? I don't, I don't just want to use their software and run the model. I want to modify the model. So the first thing I did was uh, I created this peanut R package. So this package is extracted from their C++ code. I extracted their code. I extracted their algorithm from their code. I documented everything and make it in R. Um, so this, this is a new package. Uh, we're thinking about writing a 
you know, uh, methodology paper just to release this package. Um, it's possibly the simplest paper I've ever written. <laughs> But I think it's just have some something that will settable so people um, people use it. It's you can it's free open source and if you're interested you can look at you can look at it on GitHub. Um, and I think yeah I'll end my present presentation here. Um, and before that I would like to so this is my team at Harvard Forest and uh, my team at uh, NC State. So Ian's here. <laughs> and my community members. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Well, thank you, Dr. Gao. Uh, we have about 18 minutes for questions. Um, so if anyone has questions, feel free to ask them. And just a reminder to please repeat the questions from the audience. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that sounds great. Thank you very much. On the model that you're developing for uh, tree species in the Northeast, there's a long history of these models going back many years, identifying the areas in which you might expect to find the species. But obviously, if you've paved over and created a parking lot, or there are other factors of harvest, they might change. Are you going to put a ground truthing element to feedback on predictions and see if you can iterate and get a more accurate model? And sorry, it's such a long question. So the question is, um, how do we constrain that uh, ground truth reality, right? It's a very critical question. So by doing this um, map thing, whoops, it's not going back. It's not? OK. So when we're doing this, we're using forest inventory analysis data. You know, those FI plots, those are experts going out to the field. They search, uh, they survey those points and see well, what our species and they measure their um, diameter, um, those data. We're, yeah, we are constrained by this data, data source to make this map. Yep. I also had a question about the, about the species. So first one was, was how is it derived? And it's derived from FIA plot data? Yeah. And that sounds like a great idea. And how does it do in places where the species are changing, right? So in Massachusetts, you've got a lot of hemlock or dying being replaced by some mystery species, you know, that we don't know what it is. And so, and I think, so, so how are you going to deal, any ideas for how you're going to deal with when species are changing? Okay, thanks. So the question is how we're doing this, like if species are changing. So these maps are just for one year. So they don't have changes. So what we did was we, we grabbed those um, FIA data in 2015 and 2019, and we fit this model, we, I mean Google AI, and then uh, it come up with this 20, so we, we call it the species map in 2019. So we don't have any changes at this point. But ideally, we would want to have, we, want, we would want to go back in time because FI data has a long history, right? We can, um, that's, what well, I would say that's ideally because now this AI does not, does not um, include Landsat data. So it's using Sentinel to, Sentinel to, again, it's 2015, right? So we're in this short term. But yeah, that's a good question. Very good to use FIA data. Yo, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thanks for the question, yeah. We have a question from online relating oh. to that. Um, could the species specific map begin to get at forest health transitions once you have time series of data? Forest, um, I'm not very familiar with how people do forest health, but I would say if you have the time series, yes, I think this map can do a lot of things, right? It's just, I mean, at this point, we don't have time series of this species. We only have like a one year uh, or two years of species changes. Yeah. Yep. Um, you mentioned that the course resolution might have this bias for spring. And I'm just curious, like, if you think that is true globally, and then why that might be the case. Is it, is it, is it true to look more in the US or elsewhere, or is that it's just always the case? Yeah, that's a good question, thanks. So the question is, um, why do we think, or how do we explain the course resolution bias in spring phenology? I wish I could have a whiteboard, but, so I would just describe that. Um, it, it's, it, there are some mixed pixel effects, right? You have course resolution, of course, you have a larger area, um, and it varies space by space, because, I mean, if you're, think about it, if you are in a homogeneous region, 
your coarse resolution or finer resolution, it doesn't matter because, I mean, the, it's pretty homogeneous. But in the heterogeneous regions, um, we think that the signal in the, for the satellite remote sensing is more dominated by the earlier spring phenology trees or plants. Because if you think about this curve, there are a bunch of those curves, right? And you're observing those from satellite images. And the signal to noise ratio for higher uh, EVI to or EVI, those leaf greenness indices will be higher. So our algorithm tend to pick those high signal, high signal to noise ratio points. And then your curve is like, you're, you know, you have a bunch of curves, but it's not mean or median, it's like higher and higher, you know, and then you will get earlier and earlier. That's, that's our hypothesis. So we are trying to use the model to um, predict some of those heterogeneous regions for global uh, flux tower sites, because we also, at this moment, we also have a data set uh, from um, planet image. I don't know if you're uh, familiar with that. It's three meter, three meter resolution, so it's pretty fine resolution. Uh, at North America uh, flux tower sites. So we grab those with two meter, uh, th sorry, three meter, and we have this 30 meter product, and we have 500 meter product. We want to build a model to understand why this is happening and how can we quantify the um, bias. Yeah, that's a really good question, thanks. Yep. Yeah, that's an interesting question, thanks. So the question is, how do we explain this um, maximum thing, like relatively more important than green sea changes? Um, so first, I wanna say this is, this is not just for forests. We grabbed, the, you can tell here, croplands, deciduous forests, evergreen, mixed forests, and savanna are, so flex tower sites. And the second is, we didn't investigate whether green sea is getting longer or shorter, um, because there are, I think there are ongoing debates about whether uh, green sea lens is getting longer or shorter. And I think it varies by spaces, right, by, by, by places. Um, so what we did was we just say we are using this um, proxies, I would say, proxies to study this um, problem. And we found even maximum or GPP maximum is more important than green sea lens changes. It could be it's like species variation or um, the places we're looking at, I mean, those flux tower sites might have some um, bias in some species because those are not evenly uh, distributed, right? Some, possibly you will have more forested sites than other sites, and then you will have a bias in the um, species distribution and other things. But we didn't look at that. We, we just say, well, that's overall. You can, you can, you can tell, I mean, they're, the variation, um, they vary by these biome types, and that's for all of the biome types. And it, I assume or I suspect it will vary by um, species at different locations as well. So we just say, well, the overall, we think it's, it's, um, it's the uh, maximum biomass is the dominant. Um, following that question, I think um, this is also limited to, um, so this study is also limited to the special region we're investigating, right? We, even though we said it's, it's good, or it's inform informative. It's informative in, um, in um, at upscaling this GPP size, but we didn't find that, we didn't model that site level effects. So you have to, like I said, you have to observe those site background GPP then to fit this model and upscale, but we don't have those background information. So we are only looking at those locations. And following that question, I think for now, because the 
Boston University student already figured that out. So possibly we're, we can do some analysis like using his model to combine it with this model to um, map out the dynamics of this GPP and how this varies by space, how this varies by species. And uh, I mean, we have to have that species map first. Yeah, that's a really good question, thanks. We have another online question. Mm -hmm. um, does your BLSP model accommodate factors such as spongy moth defoliation or other insect damage to trees? Ah, so I would, the short, short answer is no. Um, that's a really good question because it also involves some like disturbance, right? If you're, if you're borrowing information from, from uh, previous years and you're, oops. Whatever, so I will just, so if you're borrowing information from other years, and if that year changes, right, then your information is not representative. Uh, we didn't encounter that in, in this model. We're just assuming, I mean, you're studying those errors and there is no disturbance like fire or uh, disease or uh, dramatic uh, climate change, I would say. If dramatic climate change happened at some place, the prior information might not be representative. That's also the problem we haven't, um, solved. Um, I think we, yeah, that's a, that's a good, good one. I think when we were thinking about this uh, disturbance thing, we were thinking users might be able to use some disturbance detection algorithm, for example, CCDC or, um, or Latch and R, those algorithms to detect those changes and only use those stable, re stable years to fit this model and get phenology. Uh, because, I mean, if you have changes, of course, the information will be lost. Um, yeah. Yeah, thanks. That's a, that's a good question. So EVI2 saturation, right? Uh, I think NDVI is more um, sustainable to, or no, sorry, NDVI is more vulnerable to uh, saturation. So that's why we didn't choose NDVI. And EVI2, sorry, EVI is more um, noisy than EVI2 because EVI uses the blue band. Blue band is noisier then uh, the EVI2 is a two band version. So it only uses red band and near infrared. So avoid using blue band. Is there any saturation in EVI2? I guess it will be there. But like you said, in the tropics, those are like evergreen trees, right? Their leaf biomass is, or their leaf greenness tend to be high over the years. But the model, the model, we're, we're trimming phenology, right? So the model is better in deciduous forest, I would say. And I think there are ongoing debate whether we should retrieve phenology for evergreen, you know, because I mean, people are understanding what, what's the start of season for evergreen, right? You can, if you do GPP, it might be reasonable because I mean, they do photosynthesis, they start, it might be photosynthetic um, growing season. But if you do leaf greenness, I mean, their leaves are there, right? But that's a good question, thanks. Any final questions? Well, that's all. Let's give Dr. Gao a final round of applause. Thank you all. Thank you to those of us who joined us online. For those in person, I'm happy to continue the conversation at lunch. And thank you again. Thanks. Thanks.